Have you ever been to a planetarium? Remember walking into that big room with its curved walls and round ceiling? You settled into your chair and the room got dark. And slowly, one by one, the stars came out. In a planetarium, the stars shine, even in the middle of the day, because of the large star projector in the center of the room. This special machine projects the stars as they would appear in the real night sky onto the planetarium ceiling. And guess what? Now you have a planetarium in your own room where you can explore the night sky and discover the exciting world of astronomy. Thousands of years ago, people had a lot of time to look up at the night sky. Remember, they didn't have TVs, movies, or video games back then. When they connected the stars with imaginary lines, shapes of animals, heroes, and monsters could be seen. These same people created stories about the star pictures and told them to their children, who in turn passed them on to their children, and so on. We call these star stories myths. The best known come from the ancient Greeks, but all myths, no matter which culture they originated with, are rich with tales of powerful beings, beautiful maidens, and incredible animals. The star patterns our ancestors created did more than provide stories to pass down from generation to generation. The calendar we know today didn't exist back then, so people had to rely on clues from nature. Many looked to the sky. They noticed that certain stars and patterns of stars appeared in the sky at certain times. Some stars became visible when spring arrived, the time for planting crops. Different stars would only appear months later in the fall, the time for harvest. The sky became a tool for people to use, a tool that helped them keep track of time and understand their world. Your home planetarium is a tool of exploration. With it, you can turn an ordinary room into a 360-degree space theater. Stars, lines, and names will be projected onto the walls and ceiling. By following the activity guide instructions, you'll be able to create the night sky for any month or season of the year, right down to the day and hour. With the meteor maker, you'll create a meteor shower or guide your very own comet. You can even detach the star sphere and take it outside where its glow-in-the-dark stars will be your map to the real night sky. By listening to this audio tour, you'll hear some of the ancient myths and learn more about stars and other fascinating objects in space. Now, please stop this audio tour and get familiar with your planetarium. The best way to do this is to read through the activity guide. As this audio tour continues, it will be helpful if you're comfortable with the operation of your planetarium. When you're ready, Resume the audio tour, sit back, and enjoy the show. Track two. Welcome back. Before we move on to the night sky, let's talk about the star we see during the day, the sun. All stars are globes of hot, glowing gases that emit light and other kinds of energy. Luckily for us, our star, the sun, is only 93 million miles away. Now that's a big number, but compared to the other stars, the sun isn't very far away at all. Astronomers, scientists who study stars, planets, and other space objects, are used to dealing with much greater distances. Distances so large that they use a special measurement unit called a light year. A light year is the distance a light ray travels in one year, about six trillion miles. That's a six with 12 zeros behind it. Now that's a big number. After the sun, the next closest star to us, Proxima Centauri, is about 4.2 light years away. Most stars in the vicinity of the sun are about seven light years away from each other. How does the sun measure up to its stellar neighbors when it comes to size? When astronomers began to study other stars, they discovered that our star is just, well, average. Not particularly big or small as stars go, just average, which tends to surprise people. After all, the sun seems so large and bright, and it is to us. 
It's the sun's closeness to the Earth that makes it appear larger and shine so much more brilliantly than the other stars. During the day, the sun lights up the sky. But the other stars are out there. They haven't gone anywhere. We just can't see them because the brightness of our star gets in the way. Once the sky darkens after sunset, we can see other stars. At first, just the brightest ones. Then slowly, the fainter ones appear. Now please pause the audio tour and set the star sphere to project the autumn sky. Be sure that the compass on the base points north. When you're ready, continue the audio tour. Welcome to the stars of autumn. At this point, you'll want to be in a darkened room with your planetarium set up to project the autumn sky. The seven bright stars of the Big Dipper should be just above the northern horizon, the place where the Earth seems to meet the sky. And that's where we'll begin our tour of the night sky, with the Big Dipper. The seven stars of the Big Dipper are always found in the northern part of the sky. In the fall, after the sun goes down, you'll find it low in the north, just above the horizon. While we see a water dipper with a long crooked handle, people from other cultures view it differently. In England, the dipper is called the plow, while the French say it's the saucepan. The well-known star pattern of the Big Dipper is not a constellation. That's right, the Big Dipper, while easily the most popular star pattern in the sky, isn't a constellation. It's just part of one. There are actually 88 official constellations. 88 seems like a lot of constellations, but not when you remember that some of them can't be seen by people living in the Northern Hemisphere, the part of the world north of the Earth's equator. Look in your activity guide to see pictures of some of the brighter constellations that we can view from the Northern Hemisphere. The stars of the Big Dipper belong to the constellation of Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. Can you see the bear in the sky? The crooked handle is the long tail of the bear. The four stars of the Dipper mark the bear's body. Fainter stars show us the bear's back and front legs, while other stars mark the bear's head. The two bright stars at the front of the Dipper are called the pointer stars. If you follow them up in a straight line using your meteor maker, you'll come across another star, about as bright as the pointer stars. This is the most important star in the night sky, the North Star. Important for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. The North Star, or Polaris as the Greeks called it, marks the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper, or the tail of Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. To the ancient Greeks, the little bear had once been a boy named Arcus, and the great bear originally his mother, a woman named Callisto. But how did a boy and his mother become bears in the sky? The story begins with Zeus and his wife Hera. Zeus was the most powerful of all the Greek gods. His wife Hera also had magical powers. And one day when Callisto's son Arcus was very young, Hera changed Callisto into a bear. As a bear, Callisto now wandered the forests and meadows. Many years later, the teenager Arcus was hunting in the woods when he encountered Callisto. Of course, he didn't recognize his mother. After all, she looked like a bear. But Callisto hadn't forgotten her son, and overwhelmed with joy, she rushed toward him. Arcus thought he was about to be attacked by a wild bear, and he took aim with his deadly spear. Just as Arcus was about to release the spear, Zeus took pity on the two and sent down a whirlwind from the sky that swept up the bear and the boy. Zeus changed Arcus into a bear too and placed him in the sky with his mother. And there we see them in the northern sky. Callisto, the great bear, and Arcus, the little bear, together at last. On the other side of the North Star, you can see five bright stars in the shape of the letter M or W. This is the constellation of Cassiopeia the Queen, a very regal queen sitting on her royal throne. 
The queen, the great bear, and the little bear are called circumpolar constellations. Circumpolar is just a big word that means these stars remain above the horizon, never rising or setting. For observers in the northern hemisphere, the brightest stars of these constellations are visible in the north on any clear night. And speaking of north, let's get back to Polaris, the north star. To the ancient Greeks, Polaris was the pivot star, the star the entire sky seemed to circle around. Talk about being the center of attention. Most cultures took note of the North Star. To the Omaha Indians, it was the star that does not walk, while the Navajo called it the North Fire. The ancient Chinese used this star to help them locate the invisible Lord of the Universe, whose throne was found at the sky's North Pole. Ancient mariners of the South Pacific looked to what they called the star that does not move to help navigate the vast ocean northward to discover the islands of Hawaii. Whatever they called it, all of these cultures recognized the importance of the North Star. To understand what makes it so special, think about the following questions. When we see the sun move across the sky during the day, is it the sun that's moving? And when we see the stars move across the sky at night, is it the stars that are moving? No, it's not the sun or the stars. It's the earth that's moving and taking us all along for the ride. The earth rotates, spins on its axis once every 24 hours, creating day and night. This rotation makes it look like the sun and stars are moving around us. What does all this have to do with the North Star? Well, it's the only star that doesn't seem to move as the Earth rotates during the course of a night. The North Star remains motionless in the sky, while the other stars appear to rise in the east and set in the west. Now, conveniently for us, Polaris is also very close to a point in the sky called the North Celestial Pole. What does this mean? The North Star shows us where the direction north is, and to travelers and sailors of old, this was very important in helping them find their way across strange lands or treacherous seas. Let's move on and explore the rest of the sky. As the Earth revolves around the sun over the course of one year, different stars and constellations become visible at certain times. These are called seasonal constellations. Make sure your star sphere is still set to project the autumn stars. The Big Dipper should be hanging above the northern horizon, and in the southern part of the sky, you'll see four stars in the shape of a large square. This is the great square of Pegasus, part of the constellation of Pegasus the Winged Horse. The star that marks the top left corner of the square is called Alphirats. Even though it seems to belong to the square, Alphirats actually marks the head of Andromeda the princess. The remaining stars of this royal constellation extend out from Alphirats in two strands. You may have trouble seeing a lovely princess in these stars, but Andromeda is an important constellation as she's the central figure in what is probably the best known of all the Greek myths. This myth involves five constellations, Andromeda the princess, Cassiopeia the queen, Cepheus the king, Cetus the sea monster, and last but not least, the hero Perseus. A long, long time ago, Queen Cassiopeia and her husband King Cepheus ruled over a land called Ethiopia. All was calm and peaceful until the queen, a vain and boastful woman, was overheard to say that she was even more beautiful than the sea nymphs. Upset by this claim, the sea nymph swam off to Poseidon, god of the sea. The insulted nymphs asked Poseidon to teach the arrogant queen a lesson. To punish the queen for her vanity, Poseidon released Cetus, the sea monster, who ravaged the coastline of Ethiopia. Months of destruction followed until finally, King Cepheus consulted an oracle. The king was told the only way to stop the sea monster was to sacrifice his daughter, Andromeda. Princess Andromeda was chained to the rocky shore to await her fate. 
As Cetus began to swim toward her, the hero Perseus, who was flying overhead at the time, saw what was about to happen. After politely asking the queen and king for their daughter's hand in marriage, Perseus killed the monster with his sword and claimed Andromeda as his bride. A happy ending for everyone. Everyone but Cassiopeia. It turns out that Poseidon wasn't through with her yet. As a final punishment, she was placed in the sky as a constellation where she spends half her time hanging upside down. A rather undignified pose for this proud queen. It's easy to see all the characters in this story when you look at the autumn sky. See them? Andromeda and Perseus close to each other, with the stars of Perseus looking a bit like the letter K. The W-shaped stars of the queen are in the northern part of the sky, above the princess and next to the constellation of Cepheus the king. The stars of Cepheus are fainter than those in Cassiopeia and look like a house with a pointy roof. And Cetus the sea monster is where he should be, far below the princess where he can do her no harm. Take a close look at the autumn sky. You should notice a faint band of stars that passes through Cassiopeia and Perseus and then drops down through other constellations until it disappears below the horizon. What is it? No, not a rip in the sky or Cygnus. spilled milk as some ancient Greeks believed. Cygnus. This fuzzy band of light we call the Milky Way is actually made up of stars, but stars that are very far away from us. So far away that we can't see them as pinpoints of light like we do the stars of Ursa Major, Andromeda, or other constellations we've explored. But even though these stars are very distant, they still belong to our Milky Way galaxy, the huge collection of stars, gas, and dust our sun and planets belong to. There are billions and billions of galaxies in the universe, and each of these star cities in space is held together by gravity. How big is our galaxy? If you traveled from one side to the other at the speed of light, your journey would still take 100,000 years. Look at the constellation of Andromeda. See a small fuzzy patch of light above the stars that would mark her waist? While it doesn't look like much with the naked eye, this is another galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy. A totally different group of stars. And it's the farthest thing you can see from Earth with the naked eye. When you look at this galaxy, you're gazing at an object that's just over 2 million light years away. But even at this incredible distance, Andromeda is still the closest major galaxy to our own. Now, pause the audio tour and set your star sphere so that it projects the winter sky. Resume the tour when you're ready. Welcome to the stars of winter. Of all the seasons, the winter sky is home to the greatest number of bright stars. Can you see the constellation of Orion the Hunter projected in the south? There are three stars in a straight line that mark Orion's belt. Nowhere else in the sky will you find three stars of such brightness this close together. Four more bright stars, two above and two below, mark the hunter's knees and shoulders. There are two very interesting stars in the constellation of Orion. Look at the star that marks Orion's left knee. This star is called Rigel and is 773 light years away. But it's not the distance that makes this star special. It's the fact that it shines 55,000 times more powerfully than our sun. Just imagine how bright Rigel would appear if it were closer to us. Betelgeuse, the second brightest star in Orion, marks the hunter's right shoulder. One of the largest stars known if it replaced our sun at the center of the solar system, it would easily engulf the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Did you know there are clouds in outer space? But they don't have anything to do with the weather. These are clouds of interstellar gas and dust called nebula. One that's easy to spot is the Orion Nebula, a small fuzzy patch of light below the belt stars. Astronomers believe this nebula is a stellar nursery 
where new stars are forming. Orion is probably the best known star pattern after the Big Dipper because it actually resembles the figure of a man. According to Greek myth, Orion was the son of Poseidon, the sea god, and had the power to walk on water. Many other ancient cultures saw a man in these stars. The Chinese saw a warrior, the Arabs a giant, and the Egyptians the starry form of the god Osiris. In fact, the three ancient pyramids of Giza were built in the same positions as the three stars of Orion's belt. If you follow the line of those same three stars upwards with your meteor maker, you'll come across another winter constellation, Taurus the Bull. Can you spot it? Aldebaran, the brightest star, is the eye of the bull, and a V-shaped group of stars marks Taurus's face. On what would be the shoulder of the bull, you can see a tight grouping of six or seven stars. This is the Pleiades Star Cluster, also known as the Seven Sisters. <laughs> when you follow the line of Orion's belt down, you can find your way to the brightest star in the entire night sky. So bright, in fact, that you really don't need help locating it. This is Sirius, the dog star. So named because it is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, the great dog. Another bright star, Procyon, is above the great dog in the small constellation of Canis Minor. You guessed it, the little dog. Some ancient Greeks believed these canines to be the two hunting dogs of Orion, who helped their master track down game. Now look above and to the left of Orion. You'll find the two brightest stars of the constellation Gemini, the twins. These stars, Castor and Pollux, mark the heads of the two celestial brothers. In Greek legend, Pollux was immortal, but Castor was not. When Castor died, Pollux was terribly sad. So Zeus placed both brothers in the sky as the constellation Gemini, where they remain side by side. Above Gemini and Taurus, and to the left of Perseus, you can see the five-sided constellation Auriga, the charioteer. The chariot driver is said to be holding a goat, marked by its brightest star, Capella. It was believed that this was the goat that provided milk for the god Zeus when he was a baby. Let's move on to the stars of spring. Pause the audio tour and set your star sphere for the spring sky. So the Big Dipper is high in the north and the constellation of Leo the Lion is in the southwest part of the sky. Resume the audio tour when you're ready. Welcome to the stars of spring. You can locate the constellation Leo the Lion a couple of different ways. Find the Big Dipper. Now imagine that the Dipper is full of water and you've punched a hole in the bottom of it. Take your meteor maker and trace the path of the trickling water downward until you find yourself at the head of Leo the Lion. Or you can simply look for the shape of a backwards question mark which the stars that form the lion's head resemble. Regulus, the star at the bottom of the question mark, is the heart of the ferocious beast. Three stars to the left, in the shape of a small triangle, mark the lion's tail. Hercules is given the credit for killing this lion, who had developed a taste for the local villagers. Arrows shot at the lion simply bounced off its tough hide, which was immune to all weapons. After a great struggle, Hercules was finally able to subdue the great cat and choke it to death. Leo was placed in the sky as a constellation, a fitting place for the king of the beasts. You can find two other spring star patterns using the Big Dipper. See how the handle of the Dipper has a curve or an arc to it? Well, some clever person came up with this saying, Arc on down to Arcturus, and spike on down to Spica. Take your meteor maker and give it a try. Arc on down to Arcturus, the brightest star in the constellation of Boates. Then keep going straight down until you reach Spica, the brightest star 
of the constellation Virgo. Boates is a herdsman, a shepherd who looks after animals, like goats or sheep or cows. He moves them around from pasture to pasture through the day, making sure they graze in the good fields. But Boates is no ordinary herdsman. He doesn't look after goats or sheep or cows. What animal does he care for? Well, if you said lion, that's a very good guess, because as you can see, there's Leo fairly close to Boates in the sky. Tiger. But it isn't the lion. Look around. Do you see any other animals nearby? Need a hint? The word Arcturus is Greek for bear guard. So that means he looks after the big bear and the little bear. And look, there's the Big Dipper, which is part of the Big Bear, right in front of the herdsman with the little bear not too far away. Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the sky. A red giant star, roughly 24 times larger than our sun. It's about 36 light years away. Spica, in Virgo, is farther away, lying at a distance of 220 light years from Earth. Now look to the left of Boates, where you will see a small semicircle of stars. This is the constellation of Corona Borealis, or the Northern Crown. To the left of the crown is Hercules. Even though Hercules is the fifth largest constellation, its stars are not especially bright. The four most noticeable look a bit like a flower pot. To picture Hercules in the sky, imagine a kneeling man who's upside down. The famous 12 labors of Hercules forced him into many battles with strange creatures, four of which you can see in the sky as constellations. We've already heard about the first labor of Hercules, which ended in the death of Leo the lion. Another task involved Hydra, a multi-headed snake who lived on the edge of a swamp, attacking all who passed by. Hercules struggled with the snake, but every time he cut off one of the heads, two grew back in its place. To make matters worse, in the middle of the fight, a large crab scuttled out and bit Hercules on the foot. Oh, one hard stomp took care of the crab, and Hercules finally defeated the Hydra. Both the snake and the crab were changed into constellations after their deaths. Hydra can be seen in the sky as a long, sprawling constellation below Leo. The crab became the constellation of Cancer. Look for its faint stars between Leo and Gemini. One of Hercules' final labors was to steal some golden apples from a special tree in Hera's garden. To protect the apples, Hera placed Draco, the dragon, at the base of the tree. A poisoned arrow took care of the dragon, and Hercules got his apples. Hera made Draco a constellation and placed him in the northern sky between the two bears. Hercules is close by, kneeling on the head of the dragon. Now it's time to explore the stars of our last season. Again, please pause the audio tour and set your star sphere to summer so that the constellation of Cygnus is projected in the south. When you're ready, resume the audio tour. Welcome to the stars of summer. The summer sky is home to another famous star pattern, the summer triangle. Like the Big Dipper, the Summer Triangle isn't a constellation, but a very easy-to-see grouping of stars. Take your meteor maker and point it at the brightest star at the top of the constellation of Cygnus. Draw a line to the right until you reach the brightest star in the constellation of Lyra. Now, head down until you reach the brightest star in Aquila. Zoom back up to the brightest star in Cygnus and you've found the Summer Triangle. The stars of Cygnus are sometimes called the Northern Cross. You can see why. But to the ancient Greeks, Cygnus was a large swan with its wings spread out in flight. This bird was thought to be one of Zeus's many animal disguises. The star Deneb gets its name from an Arabic word that means tail, which is good because it marks the tail of the swan. A bright, super giant star, 
Deneb is about 1,500 light years away. Alberio, the single star that marks the head of Cygnus, or the foot of the Northern Cross, is actually a double star system. Want to see another? Look at the Big Dipper. See the middle star in the handle? It's called Mizor, and it has a faint companion star called Alcor. These two stars move through space together, separated by about a quarter of a light year. People with good eyesight can make out two individual stars when they look at Mizor in the night sky. To separate the double star of Alberio, you'll need a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Did you know that there's a black hole in the constellation of Cygnus? A black hole is a very large star that's collapsed in on itself, creating a gravitational pull so great that even light cannot escape it. A black hole itself is invisible, but astronomers believe that gases from nearby objects like stars are sucked into it. When this happens, the gases heat up and X-ray energy is given off, which can be detected with special telescopes. In 1971, a source of X-ray radiation was found in the constellation of Cygnus. Since then, more X-rays and possible black holes have been located in our galaxy and others. Right of Cygnus, you find the constellation of Lyra, which may be small, but its bright star, Vega, is fifth brightest in the sky. Lyra is the harp that belonged to Orpheus, said to be the greatest musician who ever lived. The star name Vega comes from Arabic words that mean the swooping eagle or vulture, as the Arabs saw birds instead of a harp. Below Cygnus and Lyra is Aquila the eagle. In Greek mythology, Aquila was the eagle of the gods the bird who carried the thunderbolts which an angry Zeus threw at his enemies. Altair, the brightest star in Aquila, is similar to our sun, but lies at a distance of 17 light years. An archer and a scorpion are found below Aquila, just above the southern horizon. The stars of Sagittarius the archer look like a teapot with the handle on the left and the spout on the right. But of course, this isn't a teapot. Sagittarius is a centaur, a creature with the body and four legs of a horse, but the chest, arms, and head of a man. The centaur is holding up a bow and arrow, taking aim in the direction of Scorpius. Scorpius the scorpion has an S-shaped arrangement of stars which look like the body of a scorpion, with a tail curving down and around into the stinger. Its brightest star, Antares, gets its name from the Greek meaning rival of Mars because of its strong reddish-orange color in the night sky. This scorpion's famous because it's the creature who killed the great hunter Orion. One version of the story says the Earth sent the scorpion to sting Orion, who had boasted that he could conquer any wild beast. The two constellations appear opposite each other in the sky. Never sharing the sky with the creature who caused his death, Orion rises in the east only after the scorpion has set in the west. Want to see the center of our galaxy? When you look towards the tail of Scorpius, actually at an area above the stars that mark its stinger, you're looking towards the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Summer is the best time to view the Milky Way in the real night sky as this fuzzy band of light stretches through the summer triangle into Sagittarius and Scorpius. On any clear night from a dark location outdoors, you can see three to four thousand stars with the unaided eye. This number is cut down when light pollution enters the picture. Light pollution is the sky glow above cities and towns, caused by thousands of outdoor lights. Unless you live in a very large city, you can still enjoy the brighter stars and constellations. But if you want to see the Milky Way, you'll have to get away from the city lights. We've completed our tour of the brighter seasonal star patterns. 
that leaves us with one more group of constellations, the constellations of the Zodiac. Find Scorpius in the south, then, while you slowly rotate the star sphere east to west, try to spot the remaining 11 zodiacal constellations. Sagittarius, Capricornus, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, and back to Scorpius. You already know about half of these constellations as some of the brighter star patterns we looked at in the different seasons. The zodiacal constellations are important because they're the ones the sun appears to move through over the course of one year as the Earth orbits around it. As seen from Earth, the sun appears to move in two ways. An east to west motion as it travels across the sky each day and a west to east motion as it moves against the background stars over one year. The path the sun takes through the constellations of the zodiac each year is called the ecliptic. And it's along the ecliptic that the time settings on your planetarium follow. The word planet means wandering star. The ancient Greeks didn't know there were other worlds belonging to our solar system. These bright objects looked like stars, but moved differently than all the others. Five of the eight other planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter, are visible with the naked eye, although Mercury is very hard to spot. All of the planets are found close to the elliptic along the band of the zodiacal constellations. Using the chart in your activity guide, you can see where each of the four brightest planets is located for any month of the year. Place the meteor slide in your meteor maker. Turn it on and move it quickly across your wall or ceiling. What do you see? A streak of light zipping across your sky. On any clear night, away from city lights, you might see up to five of these shooting stars in an hour. But are these really stars shooting across the sky? No. The proper name for these flashes of light is meteors. It all begins with a small speck of dust or dirt moving through space. How small? Feel the tip of your little finger. That's not very big, is it? Well, most of the particles of dust or dirt that become meteors are no bigger than the tip of your little finger. We see a meteor zip through the sky when these particles of dust or dirt hit the Earth's atmosphere, the blanket of air that surrounds our planet. The particles rub up against the air in our atmosphere and get very hot. This is called friction. Try it. Rub your hands together really, really fast. Keep rubbing. What's happening? Right, your hands are getting very warm. And that's friction, the rubbing together of two objects. With the particles of dust and dirt, the friction created by rubbing against the air makes them so hot they burn up, leaving the streak of light in the sky we call a meteor. At certain times during the year, the Earth passes through large areas of leftover dust and dirt in its annual orbit around the Sun. When this happens, you can see lots of meteors in what is called a meteor shower. But how many meteors you can see depends on whether the Moon is up in the sky and which meteor shower you're watching. Look in your activity guide for the meteor shower table, which will tell you the dates of some of the better meteor showers. Most of the dirt or rock specks that become meteors were left over from comets passing through the inner solar system. Almost all meteor showers can be traced back to large clumps of these particles left behind by a specific comet. Now, place one of the comet slides in your meteor maker and project it into your sky, moving it very slowly. Comets are icy snowballs, big chunks of rocks encased in frozen gases. Some people think comets and meteors are the same thing, but they're not. 
Comets are larger objects that orbit the sun. An average-sized comet is a mile or so wide. Their movement in the sky is different too. Meteors zip across the sky and are gone in a few seconds. Comets will appear in the sky as it gets dark, and if they're bright enough to be seen with the naked eye, look like a faint, unmoving patch of light. If a comet gets close enough to the sun, its nucleus, the icy snowball, heats up, and some of its ice thaws into gases. A huge ball of gas called the coma, perhaps several times larger than the Earth, will form around the nucleus. Sometimes a tail will grow and stream out from the comet, always facing away from the sun. Comets were once seen as bad omens, linked to natural disaster or the deaths of kings. And there's a possibility that it was a comet smashing into the Earth that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. For the most part, though, we see comets as beautiful space visitors who, if we're lucky, come back again. The most famous of all comets, Comet Halley, orbits the Sun every 76 years. Its last appearance in our skies took place in 1986, and it won't return until the year 2062. When you gaze up at the night sky, it's hard not to ask the question, is there anyone out there? The answer is, we simply don't know. But many astronomers believe there is life somewhere out there. It all comes down to numbers. How many worlds like ours would there be if just one star in a million had an Earth-like planet orbiting it? If this were the case, then the Milky Way galaxy, with over 300 billion stars, could have several hundred thousand planets that might support life. And that's just one galaxy out of billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. So chances are, Earth is not the only place in the universe where life exists. A hunt for life began in the 1960s with a project called SETI, or SETI. That stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. In this program, Astronomers aimed radio telescopes at certain stars, believing that if there is intelligent life out there, these alien civilizations might be using radio waves. Radio waves we could hear. Has anything been found? No, but the search continues. Where else can we look? How about in our own solar system? One of Jupiter's large moons, Europa, may have liquid water oceans below its thick shell of ice. And where there's water, there could be life. Closer still is Mars, where evidence of water in its polar ice caps has been detected. We've come a long way in our understanding of the universe since ancient stargazers first looked up at the night sky long before the telescope, computer, or space shuttle, curious, intelligent people observed the motion of the sun, stars, moon, and planets. They watched and tried to explain what they saw to the best of their ability. We've built on centuries of our ancestors' ideas and theories. Today, astronomers use large, complex telescopes to reveal the secrets of the cosmos. The Hubble Space Telescope, in orbit around the Earth is giving us incredible views of the universe. And the International Space Station is just one more step on our way to exploring the planets and stars firsthand. But anyone who looks up at the night sky is an explorer. Like our ancestors who first used the sky as a calendar, you don't need fancy instruments or machines to discover stars and constellations. When you want to explore the world of astronomy even more, a simple pair of binoculars or a small telescope can open other doors for you. Exploration and discovery. They're waiting for you. We hope you'll take what you learn from your planetarium and enjoy the stars, both the ones in your room and the real stars waiting for you outside. 
Thanks for joining us on this audio tour of the night sky. 